Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Greiner, your host for today's Swine It podcast. And with me today, I have Victoria Wilson, who is the feed milk coordinator for Seaboard Foods. Hello, Victoria. How are you today? Good. Thank you so much for having me today and that great introduction. Um, I'm excited. <laughs> You're welcome. We're glad to have you on today. Um, well, Victoria, before we get started really talking um, about the topic at hand, maybe give our audience a little bit of background about who you are and what you're currently doing. Of course. So I originally hail from St. Charles, Missouri, which is just about an hour outside of St. Louis. I grew up in a suburb um, and riding horses. I went to my bachelor's in animal science at University of Missouri in Columbia um, or Mizzou. I started there with a cattle focus, thinking I was going to run a cow-calf operation the rest of my life. And then about my second year, I took a biochemistry class and a swine nutrition class at the same time, and it all made sense, and I haven't looked back. (laughs) Um, I followed that heart and drive for swine nutrition up to Iowa State. Um, I finished my master's last year. Um, I studied under Dr. Brian Kerr at front of the USDA and was partially under Dr. Laura Greiner. So that was a lot of fun. I call it the best of both worlds. <laughs> um, I took a hiatus kind of out of my career for about six months after I finished my master's and I was Miss Rodeo, Missouri 2021. I got to travel across the United States and kind of promote agriculture and rodeo and be do a little bit of PR and marketing. And then I joined Seaboard back in February um, as a feed milk coordinator. And I do just about anything and everything you could think of with numbers in a feed mill. Um, I do a lot of reporting back to nutritionists, feed mill accounting, grain merchandising, things like that. I do grain sampling and analysis, um, quality analysis on anything from our grain, pellets, complete feeds. Um, And then I manage a lot of feed ordering for about 65 barns. Um, 40 of those are finishers. Eight are nurseries and the rest are sow farms. So it keeps me busy. That does sound like a lot to do in any given day. So (laughs) It's fun. It it really is. It keeps me on my toes. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's the kind of job to have. One that, that always keeps you busy. Makes the day go by fast for sure. Well, Victoria, I really kind of want to jump into that a little bit from a female perspective. We haven't really had someone on who's talked from that perspective, um, at least at least to me, um, in the last year when I've been doing these podcasts. And so I think this could be interesting. Um, as we talked beforehand, you know, we have some producers that are listening that maybe have their own feed mills. We have others that certainly are ordering uh, from a feed mill. And, you know, others that might just be a little bit naturally curious about what goes on in that feed mill. So let's kind of start from beginning and work towards the end. So let's start from ingredients coming into your mill. You had mentioned that you were involved in grain receiving. And so what does that look like? If you say you're working in grain receiving, what exactly is that? Okay, yeah. So... In order to make feed, you have to have ingredients. And so we have our own um, chuck scale. So we um, have our own ingredients that I order every week um, based on our usages from the three-week average. Um, When those trucks come in, I have, if it's a corn truck, I probe the, um, the grain cart and take in the sample and I grade it. So I send it through a splitter, do moisture and um, bushel weight, and then we will send it and grade it. Um, for any damaged kernels, bugs, anything that could be wrong with it. Um, And then any load that we have not received from that elevator, like an elevator previous in that week, we test for mycotoxin analysis. So we test for aflatoxin, deoxynivalenol, and then fumonisin. So those are the three that we mostly focus on because we find those to be the most important in swine. Um, Once they pass those tests, um, we will take the grain in and receive it. And then from there, it goes to big corn bin, and then we'll send it to the grinder. Mm -hmm. Very good. So you mentioned a couple of mycotoxins that that you test for, and we've talked about mycotoxins before on our podcast, and I think we have one coming up again shortly, so since we're about ready to start harvesting again. What 
what type of test are you running, right? So you said you're doing it right there in the mill. And some of our listeners might be more familiar with the ones we ship out and wait for tests to come back. So what are you running there in the mill? So we're using um, like a strip test um, from Neogen. That's about all I can talk on it. <laughs> Do you, does it require much sample preparation? Is it pretty straightforward? It's very straightforward. I think it's 10 steps um, in about 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, we, say we grind the corn, um, put it in either ethanol or DI water, and it goes in the kicker for three minutes, comes out. We follow the protocol of um, different dilutants and then send it in the scanner. Scanner scans it, pops out a number, and we just mark it off and record it. Mm -hmm. So what if you came back with a sample that was high? Is it an immediate not going to accept or do you do a second run? How do you kind of handle that quality control portion? So from we kind of pre-manage that by um, when we probe the truck, we probe both sides, both hoppers. So when we bring that in, we have a representative sample that we that's what we call representative and so is from both sides. And then so um we know that mycotoxins can be hot in one little spot and then you go test the truck again and it doesn't. So if usually if it's close, if I, so aflatoxin, we cap at 20 parts per billion in the truck. So if it's going to be 25, I personally will retest. I will re get a renew sample and retest nine times out of 10. It pops hotter. <laughs> I've learned. <laughs> Um, you have the faith, you want to keep the faith with it, but most of the time it pops hotter. <laughs> um, aflatoxin has actually been the one that we've tested like high on the most. I feel like since I've been here coming from the Midwest, I'm used to like Don and Fumonison. <laughs> so seeing aflatoxin was like, what? <laughs> it was weird. <laughs> yeah. So I think that's an interesting, um, observation and I heard you throw out a level there and, and I, it's a comment we get a lot from producers is, well, what's the right number from a mycotoxin perspective? And, you know, what I would probably tell them, you know, the number that you threw out, I, I think it's fair. It's really something that they need to talk to their nutritionist about because it's going to depend really on how much of that product is going to be in the final fee as to, you know, what level you're going to be able to use there at the, at the feed mill from an acceptance standpoint. Would you agree? Correct. I would say we set like the nutritionists have set that level um, and feed safety have set that level. Um, that I also think comes into account with how much corn we're bringing in and how much corn we're using and the amount of corn that that one truckload is going to go into is crazy. <laughs> like I can't even remember how big, how many bushels are one are one of three corn bins holds, but it's, it's a lot of corn in my opinion. Um, so the other thing that some producers do or some feed mills do is they'll run an NIR test on that grain. Is that something you do at the same time or do you wait and do it on final feed? So we run our NIR on a daily corn sample, so it won't be every truck. Um, we get our moisture and bushel weight initially from um, just a moisture scanner or Dickie John. Um, so we get that initial moisture there, but then we will take a daily sample. So we have a, we take a small sample of the corn from each truck from the day, we grind it down and then we'll do a um, analysis on the NIR. So we'll get moisture, fiber, starch, all the good stuff. Mm -hmm. So NIR is something that maybe some of our audience may not be as familiar with. Could you maybe explain what that is and what it does? Yeah, so it's a near infrared scanning. You have a tablet that you can read it on and you have a scanner and you have you level out your sample and you kind of probe in a way each little like an air of representative area of the sample that you have. Um we scan I think five or six times and so we move it each time. So it scans for like 5 seconds and then you move it and it's five seconds in that one. And then it combines all that and averages it. And then it pops up a little screen and tells you, this is your moisture. This is your fiber. This is your starch. And it just, it's handy. No lab work involved. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think it's something important to, to communicate to people too, is that it has to 
use equations, right, mm -hmm. to come up with what those values are. And so if you are considering using an NIR at your feed mill, you do want to make sure you're working with a group that has equations that can be used to help you estimate that. Would that be a fair statement? Yes, we we work with a company that like has that does all the data management within that for us. Um, mm -hmm. And we just get numbers popped back out to us. So it's really mm -hmm. handy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yep. And every ingredient will have different equations. And so I think that's, you know, that's important. But NAR is something that, well, probably 10 years ago, uh, we started really introducing into the feed mills. And it's, a, again, it's a quick way to get an idea, particularly if you're buying soybean meal or something, you know, are you within specifications or are you not? Correct. Yeah. And so we'll scan. We, so we scan corn, soybean, and then we also do our complete feeds. So Okay. So you do a final check then as a quality control on your mixing and, and where you're at. Yeah. And we'll, we'll also send off samples to the lab to also be double backed and compare mm -hmm. and make sure we're staying on track. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to remind people too, is if you do have your own mill and you are running some of these tests, whether it's mycotoxins or NIRs for an idea of what your nutrient content is, is that you still should send it off to a third party lab that does the more intensive tests to make sure that everything's looking correct. Yes, I, I definitely agree. It's a good double check for you. How often are you sending samples out to third party? Um, so it would be weekly and we scan every day. So, okay. So just kind of an idea. And it's a, it's a large mill. It's manufacturing quite a few tons, but, um, so if smaller producers maybe do it once a month, but you know, larger groups weekly is a good idea. Yes. Yeah, so our mill produces, we have a, we're in a single pellet mill here at the Guyman location and we produce about 2,600 tons a week. So okay. that gives you an Great. idea. Yeah, that's perfect because it's a great idea. Thank you. Um, so let's kind of move on from there. So we have our initial product. Um, and as you just mentioned, your mill is really involved with pelleting. And so let's talk about pelleting because sometimes that's an elusive process for many of our listeners where they know kind of what it is, but they don't really know what goes into it. So could you explain the, the pelleting process itself? Yes. So it's actually interesting because I personally came coming from Iowa state thought we just fed mash all the time <laughs> and pellets went to baby pigs. Like that's just what I thought. And I got here and they're like, Nope, we pellet everything. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so the, we grind down our ingredients and we batch it up. We mix it for X amount of time. And then we send it to the pelleter. Pelleter uses heat to form heat and pressure to form a pellet through a screen. So with pelleting, we have now grinded down our corn and batched it up to mix it with our other ingredients that we've added. And we're going to send it to the pelleter to where it's going to use heat and pressure from steam to send it through a screen that's going to form it into a cylinder. Um, our heat can impact your um, pellet quality as long along with your screen um, like maintenance and making sure it's cleaned out and you don't have a bunch of fines sitting in it to where it's not going to pressure through um, or things like that. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of a quick summary of, of what pelleting is. And I've heard you talk a little bit there about temperature. So let's talk about some of the things that can influence a good pellet, because I think we've all been in those situations where we order a pellet and by the time it gets into the to the feeder it's more like a crumble rather than a pellet so what could influence that pellet quality so like i said heat heat can the heat of the actual um pellet mill can uh, affect that so the higher the heat um you can see a better pellet usually formed um some other things that could impact it is where you're putting your lipid in at um, if you're putting it in um, prior to or spraying it on after. Um, and then you can also see um, like high fiber having an impact on it or um, different types of ingredients. Or I've also seen with particle sizing, if you don't have a good, um, equal, I don't want to say equilibrium, but like a cross the board pellet size that is like, it's, it just doesn't hold together, I guess. So it crumbles. <laughs> 
Okay, so I think that actually did a nice job of, of kind of explaining some things we should consider, particularly um, if we're considering different ingredients, we need to be mindful of fat quality or composition, not quality, but composition um, of that diet. We also need to be thinking about how much fiber is in that ingredient that we want to use, because again, our nutritionist may come back and say, we can't use that product, right? Because it's not going to give us a good pellet. Um, one of the things we do talk about too is pellet dur durability index. And can you maybe talk a little bit about what that means? So our, we actually do PDI, we call it PDI, pellet mm -hmm. durability index. We um, will do that actually on every, well, every batch, we will collect a sample and the um, mill will do that, I guess. Um, I personally do not do PDI testing. Well, that sounds good. No, I agree. I think PDI, again, it, everybody has to have kind of an idea of where that number needs to be. We certainly don't want it to be too hard or the pigs aren't going to eat it and we don't want it too soft or we're going to end up with crumble or, or mash back in the feeder. So I think that's a great overview, Victoria, of some things to be thinking about with pelleting, what that process is, factors to consider. And even the incoming grain, you know, maybe some opportunities for our smaller farmers who are wanting to try to be, maybe better address what's going into their bins, uh, particularly this fall, as they're bringing in their crop. You know, how can they do a better assessment of those ingredients before they store them this fall? Um, I'm going to switch gears on you just a little bit here. We have a little bit of time, and you had mentioned through your introduction that that you were not of a swine background when you came in and um, you took a swine class and it interested you. So what advice do you have for us as we you know, continue to think about how do we get young talent into the industry? How do we get people excited about pigs that have never been around them? So what advice would you have for potential employers of, of young individuals in this search for, for talent that maybe hasn't been around a pig? My biggest advice, and I would say that I've even taken part in learning over the last several months, um, be willing to explain that it's not just a pig that we're, we're feeding to put in a processing plant. Like wall to wall, what makes the world go around with swine production there's so much in between. And I think there's so, I didn't even understand this until I was here and boots on the ground and there's departments of safety, transportation. Um, there's your different production stages. There's ERM. So environmental resource management. So what's going into the lagoon and how can we use that in our biofuel plant? Um, just so many different facets of the industry, like of just swine production in this little box. There's so many different places you can go. There's, there's HR, there's recruitment, there's people who do accounting, there's feed purchasing and merchandising. There's people who are selling in product because it, we are so integrated at Seaboard Foods that it, I do get to see all of that. It like, it's so impactful because you, you're just like, wow, like I have a part in that. And I think being able to show a potential employee, that person, like that part that you can go endless miles within the swine industry and in any little area you could possibly want. Like you don't have to just love pigs, even though we all love bacon. <sighs> But it, it, like you can fit into the swine industry and be impactful in it. And you don't even have to look at a pig every day. I don't see pigs every day. And I, and I feel like I have an impactful part because I, I get to control like making sure that that feed's going to flow through those feeders and it's going to be good quality and that they're going to get the nutrients that the nutritionists want them to get. And, and I, that is important because that helps them grow and doing the feed ordering, like helping and working with the farm managers, getting to help them order feed and make sure there's feed in the feeders every day and every evening when they leave. Like that showing potential people that that's the impact you get to have 
it excites me. So I would think it would excite someone else. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So you obviously went to Mizzou with a, with a passion in animal science coming from a subdivision of a, of a very large city. What recommendations would you have for us trying to talk to the youth in, in those areas? Um, I think it comes down to part just being open-minded with them because I think a lot of my peers growing up, they weren't sure what agriculture was. They knew cowboy boots, cows give us steak, pigs give us bacon, chickens give us eggs. But I don't, I don't think you, you quite understand until you go into the city and start asking those questions, what animal does pork come from? Do you understand the lack of knowledge? about agriculture. So I think going into youth, I would say in inner cities, I would say go at it with an open mind of that. They're just not going to know. They don't know. And you're going to be the first one to tell them. And you have to be able to tell them in a way that's going to make them want, want to know more, I guess, because like when I first was introduced to agriculture, it was, I got to ride on a tractor. <laughs> When I was like three years old, my mom was like, well, we're going to go see your, your uncles and aunts this weekend. You're going to get to ride on a tractor. And I didn't know what it was when I was three, but I mean, I grew up knowing that they raised corn and beans and wheat and cotton. And, and it was, I don't know. I, I guess I see it differently. And I, I'm one of those oddballs. I feel like coming from a subdivision because I craved knowing more where I think sometimes you have, it has to partially be the, the youth that wants to crave to know more. Um, and sometimes they don't, and that's just who they are, I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's one of those constant debates, right? Um, we can sit here and we can wait for people to come to an animal science department or to, you know, want to be a part of a company and, and work somewhere in those, those, areas or those arenas, whether it's HR or accounting, and even if it's not directly with the pig, but it's more of that question of, should we be going out to them? And if we go out to them, what do we show them, right? How do we, how do we go to the inner city? How do we go to those large subdivisions? Um, you know, we have petting zoos, there's petting zoos all over They're They're there at the zoos, et cetera, but we need to take it a step further than that. Right? So, any thoughts on how to get agriculture more in front of individuals rather than waiting for them to come to us? Yeah, so I think uh, something that I kind of worked towards um, when I was Miss Rodeo, Missouri, and my my big thing um, was uh, bridging the gap was my platform. And that was bridging the gap between inner cities and agriculture and their understanding. I think bringing them the knowledge and uh, giving it the application. So I tried, I would have a class of kids and I'd be like, so the grocery store. And then I would pick one thing that everybody got excited about. You can pick any one thing. And most of the, most of them liked bacon and I don't blame them. <laughs> um, so I'd explain to them, I said, so where, where, where does bacon come from? A, a pig. Okay. A pig. Okay. What do we, what do we have to do for that pig to give us bacon? Well, you have to feed it. Oh, what goes into feeding? People have to make that. Food. So I think, I don't, I don't know if how you, I don't know if I have the secret key to how to spark interest, but I know that when I was working on that, I worked towards just giving them the knowledge because knowledge is power, I feel like. And when there's going to be curious minds and that's who you're going to grab with that. I do think that there needs to be an effort nationally to get Things like that, like a seminar that kind of introduces agriculture into those inner city schools. Because I know when I was in school, I pushed to create an FFA chapter in my high school. I graduated with like 169 people. So if that tells you how big my school was. There were schools with like 2000 in a class that were around me. And we were all told we are too urban of an area for FFA. And that, that's the problem. That's, that's why you're losing kids from the inner city 
from agriculture is because people don't they 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 believe that because you come from a city you can't be involved in agriculture or you can't learn about it because you're not in it but you if you choose to immerse yourself in it you can learn about it and you learn to appreciate it and what it gives to the entire world because we feed a lot of people at the United States with our agriculture industry and it's crazy to think about oh, very good i think that's a really great insight and i appreciate you sharing that with us well, I, I see our time is kind of coming to an end. And as you know, we like to ask our guest speakers a couple of questions. So I'm going to start with, um, what's your favorite swine resource? Swine resource? As a nutritionist, I love the NRC. <laughs> I really do. Um, a second one would probably be the Swine Nutrition Guide that Kansas State publishes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Those are both very good resources. Um, how about something that, that's not related to pigs that you're currently reading or would suggest to the audience? So currently, I'm actually reading Grace, Not Perfection by Emily Lee. Um, it's definitely a good way to work on your soft skills and kind of give yourself some grace, like teaching yourself how to do that, because I think often or not, more often than not, um, we're our worst critics. And so it kind of is helping me not be my own worst critic. Very good. I'll have to read that book. I've always seen the quote, right? I have the quote actually in our house, but I've never read the book. So it's a good book. We'll have to pick the book up. Um, so the last question we like to ask is if you can think of somebody that you define as successful and you don't have to tell us the person, just picture them in your mind. What's a trait that they possess that you think has allowed them to be successful? Uh, I would say probably two. Being flexible, but staying determined in your goals. Um, you never know what's going to happen when, when you're going after your goals. Um, so you have to be flexible with the mishaps and whatever's going to happen is going to happen. But I think just staying focused and determined to reach the end goal and just being flexible to how you get there. I think that's probably the most important and like the most impactful personality traits. Very good. Well, Victoria, I do want to thank you for your time again today for our listeners. This is Victoria Wilson. And again, she is a feed mill coordinator uh, there at Seaboard Foods. Uh, out in Oklahoma. So thank you so much, Victoria, for your time today. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. Imagine if with a few key concepts, you could have the potential to create a massive positive impact by bringing from hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars for swine producers. Join us on this small group and go to the next level of swine nutrition on this seven week long elite online training and applied swine nutrition and feeding by myself and my world-class invited speakers. Additionally, you enjoy an exclusive community to exchange ideas. Go now to www.eliteswinenutritionist.com.